city, I would say. <laughs> um, just a few comments, and then I know there'll be questions. Uh, it was a great pleasure to hear the two talks, and I was struck uh, at the fact that they both started with the foundational enterprise of the Spaniards. As you said, Jorge, this was an extraordinary way of conducting the business of empire. Uh, the Spaniards um, forged their colonizing uh, efforts by creating uh, heterogeneous societies, unlike the society of the north, where there were pilgrims establishing groups of peers. Uh, the Spaniards uh, pushed from um, Central America and Mexico on south through founding cities with a rationality that became quite visible in the design that we saw. It was the sort of rational square, usually dominated by uh, the main square that had the church, and very often uh, the audiencia, or the cabildo, mm -hmm. the seat of government. And uh, I was struck, and maybe we can talk a little bit uh, afterwards, at the different kind of emplacement that these two cities <laughs> that you, you chose to talk about. Uh, in the case of Quito, it's uh, an Andean placement in an area where, going back to yesterday's very suggestive talk about amnesia, uh, amnesia is a little harder in the Andes, in Latin America, because of the strength of the pre-Columbian uh, Inca Empire. And I wanted to ask Felipe afterwards to talk a little bit about the traces of that imperial past that's been kind of uh, covered by the uh, Spanish layering. In the case of Buenos Aires, uh, we've always been taught I bet you remember, Jorge, at school we were told there wasn't anything here. Uh, <laughs> there were some nobadic tribes, you know, it's sort of terra nula, sort of like an Australia um, of the space. And if anything, uh, we were um, told stories of attempts like the one of Solis. Yeah. Uh, uh, some of the early explorers who were as Borges says, with great humor, uh, they fasted and the Indians feasted, which was his way of saying that <laughs> it was a, they were <laughs> they were presumably eaten up by the locals, which created that sense of being in a place that, although it was called a river of silver, plata meaning silver, it uh, pointed to this kind of longing for riches that drove uh, the colonizing impetus down towards the south. And except for Potosi uh, mm -hmm. and the silver uh, and gold of the Andes and of Mexico, the southern reaches of the empire were colossal disappointments. One had to wait for the 19th century and smuggling uh, to really enrich the harbor. Uh, in the case of uh, Buenos Aires, it's um, fascinating to think that the emplacement has, um, called, has made us uh, natives of Buenos Aires be called porteños, people of the harbor. And we have sort of turned our backs on the rest of the country in many ways. And I wonder how Quito negotiates that in terms of its national identity. Uh, so I'd love to talk a little bit more about that sense of amnesia vis-a-vis -vis the original mm -hmm. space. In the case of uh, La Boca that you um, described so richly, Jorge, I was going to add uh, that when at the end of the 19th century uh, Buenos Aires realizes that its harbor is insufficient for the kind of commerce it has to deal with, it took a hundred days to unload a ship because it was such a shallow area that they couldn't bring the ships to the actual docks. So they decide to build a harbor, and there are two competing uh, 
projects just like the tangos you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> One is by uh, Ingeniero Huergo, which is to build the harbor in, in La Boca, La Boca. Yeah. and that's the populist yeah. project that wants to return to the founding yeah. mythology of the city. The other is the winning one by uh, Mr. Madero, Madero, and it gets built further north. The north in Buenos Aires is always the place of um, expansion and greater wealth. So let me stop here because I don't uh, want to um, take up the precious time for questions, but maybe we can uh, start talking about some of these questions. Maybe, maybe. I'll begin in, uh, uh, particularly in relation to this idea of amnesia and uh, sort of the Inca trace. Tribute to you. Because uh, um, in a way, I think that it, not that dissimilar to Buenos Aires, the, the, the mindset of the Spaniards when they arrived to Quito was this idea that there was nothing there, that things had to be cleared yeah. for a new beginning to take place. So of course they couldn't do that, it, do that in sort of the kingdom uh, of Peru because the yes, monumentality yes. of the uh, Inca Empire was very difficult to bring down. In the case of, uh, um, of Quito, the traces are non-existent. I mean, you might find a stone here and there, but it was a complete clearing of the ground. And actually, the foundation of the, uh, of the Spanish city was about 400 or 500 meters away from the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Incan foundation to be able to sort of very clearly state uh, this distinction. But I think we're sort of um, uh, the, the mixture or sort of the uh, uh, the traces of the uh, of, of the Incan culture comes into uh, um, in sort of the scenario of the city has to do with the way that the interiors begin to operate, in which sort of the abundance of gold that existed in uh, 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 sort of in the Inca Empire and in particular was stored in Quito uh, that had come from the Janganatis from uh, from the jungle was what became sort of the base material to begin to create a new religious imagery through uh, a, a very precise Baroque style and a complete sort of uh, uh, distinction between extremely, extremely uh, lush uh, interior environments and a very sort of uh, mm -hmm. uh, rec recessed or sort of uh, economical exterior fabric, which still sort of uh, exists in the city today and which is still very present in the psyche of, uh, uh, of Quito. If you actually go travel to the city today, the money is always in the interior. The, the exterior is always very, it's very sort of low key. May I, may I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, in, in uh, talking about this, um, uh, as I had to make the yeah. point, of course, I had to yeah. push the things a little bit, uh, exaggerate, but I mean, this kind of duality between Buenos Aires and this, this nuisance, which is this little thing, you know, on the, on the south uh, of the Barrio de la Boca that is always, you know, trouble. <laughs> uh, but it, it seems to be that it's absolutely necessary also to survive. Buenos Aires does not have any in, in its territory uh, when it begins to be really an important city, any competing city. My sense when I go to Ecuador is that Quito exists with with the idea that there is Guayaquil, which yeah. is the the opposite. You know, it's the harbor, it's on the on the yeah. lowlands, and it's a completely different city. I mean, and a very important city too. Right, but that that, yeah. that I think is a is a, a very important comparison today. Yeah, but I think the issue in, those, no. in the in the fifteen and sixteen hundreds is that Guayaquil, in a way, was founded because. It was much, it was sort of, there were two routes to arrive uh, to the Pacific. One was from Cartagena through the Andes, which is the yeah. one that I showed. The other one was through Panama and down by boat. Yeah. Uh, and basically, the route through the Andes became much more prevalent. Mm -hmm. So, Guayaquil was not really uh, a city of importance until the, the, the uh, early 1900s when it became the yeah, sort of the, the modern port and the industrial capital mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the city. What I do think is uh, uh, important in the relation of the two cities today is that very different from, uh, uh, from many other uh, South American countries, we do not have a primary city, but actually we have two smaller cities. So the problematics of growth and extension that we see in a lot of the other metropolitan areas have not really happened in Quito. And I think that uh, as a city today is a much more manageable and in many ways, much more para paradigmatic city to be able to begin to develop yeah. an urbanistic project for the 21st century. 
So we I, have a few I, minutes. I want so. to say something because mm. from what you said about Buenos Aires, that uh, I didn't have time nor the graphic material to, well, I could have gotten. But there is an important fact to understand uh, is that uh, it is not only that it's far away and it's a, this kind of desolate landscape, but it is really the rear we call it in more stronger terms in uh, in, in, the, then, uh, yeah, in in Spanish, the rear of the world, because uh, we are accustomed to see now Buenos Aires as this as it should be as this place that uh, sort of funnels the entrance into you know an important part of South America from the Atlantic, but when you look at uh, the times of the Spanish colony. Uh, really, circulation and arrival was always coming through the Andes. And in fact, until late, I think in the 17th, 18th century, the customs of the region was not in Buenos Aires, but in Cordoba, which is a city in the middle of the country and definitely connected with the north. Okay. So one has to understand this as the end, and the end by, end by land. And that's why it is actually a city for a long time, and I think it's the source of some of the politics still today, a city associated <laughs> with smuggling, corruption, all those things. And longing, um, and a lot of longing. A lot of longing and yeah. feeling that you are so far away from everything. So now I'm going to <laughs> ask for questions from uh, the audience. We have all of about seven or eight minutes. We can go on talking, yeah, but yeah. I'm sure you have <laughs> interesting questions. I noticed the first map was that Quito seems to be located exactly on the equator. Mm -hmm. uh, was that important for uh, celestial uh, calculations for, for the Incans? Um, less for the Incans, but actually that does raise, I think, a fantastic uh, sort of episode of the city. Uh, which is the visit of the French geodesic mission, right? Which sort of was sent to Americas to measure the curvature of the Earth, but in reality was an expedition sponsored by France to map the Americas in terms of resources, right? That was the Trojan horse inside the uh, inside the <laughs> expedition. Um, but I think what became actually f uh, uh, fascinating about these visitors in the city was that at the time, really, to be able to move because they were under the control, of, they were French they were under the control of the Spanish crown, they needed a visa to move from city to city, which meant that to move from Quito to Lima, they would actually have to send a letter to Spain, ask for permission, get the permission back, and then they would have to travel. So they actually spent about two, two to three years within Quito and its surrounding areas, and the most fascinating experiments that came out of the French geodesic mission were not part of the mission, they were out of boredom. They just sort of had to spend time there. So they began to develop a series of instruments and sort of a larger sort of scientific enterprise that was sort of the underside of the larger mission. And I think that that defined uh, very particular sort of conditions in the city, like the location of the new airport. The, the new airport today is in the baseline where sort of like on the, the, like on the mean used to, to triangulate and develop uh, the, the altitudes, define the first measured um, map of all the peaks of the Andes. So, uh, so yes, the, the location in the middle of the world was absolutely critical, but it was much more critical during the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry that I missed your presentation, but I'm getting some sense of it, but I did have the pleasure of listening to the Buenos Aires uh, presentation. And my uh, question, uh, I just begin with a very short anecdote that when I was in Buenos Aires maybe 12 years ago, I was talking to a, a, a wonderful young anthropologist who is now risen very high in the, uh, in, the, in the social science world, and we were talking about soccer and uh, about the two great teams. And yeah. I remember this is a very general. There is only one great team. <laughs> <laughs> so the anecdote will tell people why you react to this. He says uh, he's a very gentle guy, and but then the question arose about not just Boca, but his team, River River. So he says to me, uh, gentle, he was the sweetest guy in the world. But when this arose, he said, you know, when I'm in the team, when I'm in the, watching the game and I see Boca, 
I want the whole side of the stadium of Bokash to fall and crush them. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, for the first time I see this is not only about soccer and mm -hmm. intense competition, but uh, I wonder if this does uh, today, since, since soccer is almost as important as tango in, in certain ways in some parts of the world, whether this does go back to this incredible tension well, in the, this history and not just a relatively recent mm -hmm. soccer club uh, yeah. tension. So I, I, I remember well, it was it, River. It, it, it was River and yeah. Mao. It was, uh, it's a very interesting story. I mean, the rivalry is real and is not unlike that that you find in England or in Italy uh, between some of the most important mm -hmm. teams. Uh, there is an urbanistic issue, two urbanistic issues that I think are very interesting. Hard to uh, um, sort of uh, accept the first time you hear about it, but River, the rival of La Boca, actually was started, was created as a team in La Boca. It, you know, it's a, a, a initial sort of field was in the same neighborhood. Uh, and it's actually a little bit older than Boca, which is founded later, and you know, and they but uh, the same neighborhood. The thing that is distinctive then that also we might put into the equation is that River then moves and builds the Stadio Monumental, the monumental stadium, a real new stadium. I mean, compare. I mean, in terms new for the time, of course, it's now very old, but much newer than the one in Boca Juniors in a part of the city much more associated with uh, you know the expansion the rich suburbs and uh, the way the way the city is expanding towards the north the gardens the big sort of uh, public beautiful areas of the much more richer city so there is a, a change in a way of uh, of association with the social makeup of the neighborhood la boca remains to this day a very poor neighborhood although you know uh, it has improved in many other things, and of course there's a lot of tourism, like everything, and one could say that the neighborhood where River Plate is is not as wealthy as one may have thought it, would have be, it was uh, uh, 30 years ago. But there is also that class associated with it, by now in reality non-existent, but it is always associated with these two classes, the poor and the rich. So there you have it. <laughs> and I would add, um, this class tension has been in the sort of national imaginary since the early 19th century, and it was expressed with the polarity of civilization and barbarism. Oh, of course. And so it's a, it's a, um, a national psychology that has not been able to mediate between differences very successfully. Yes. This was really so fascinating, this portrait of these two cities. I, I don't know the cities, but I would love to go there. I was just yeah. pulled into it. And my, my question is, I mean, there were so interesting descriptions about the spirit, about the atmosphere, and also the physical parameters of that. And, and it was almost like a, uh, like a dialogue with, um, with resistance. On one side, uh, the mountains, the topography, and the limits. And on the other side, this, this sort of longing and this between hard and soft and water and, and the shape. Where do you see um, the, f where, where is your imagination for, for, the, for the development of the future of these cities? Actually, that's an interesting, uh, um, it's an interesting point, I think, that you're making in terms of, uh, I think, certain opposites, which is that, well, I think in Buenos Aires, the horizontality has sort of, there's been a search for some level of iconography that emerges from that horizontality. In Quito, there's a huge desire to resist the topography, yeah. and there's sort of this this fascination with you know uh, with horizontality, right? With 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 the flat line, and uh, um, I, I think that that has been sort of operative in all the projects that have actually influenced the city. I think for me. Today, the, the sort of the, the pivotal moment uh, in terms of the project of the future is actually, it, it's a in terms of the, 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 the 21st century project for Quito has to do with understanding the relationship of the lower valleys to the city above. Uh, and I think what's happening right now is that the expansion of the city is just creating a much weaker replica of the city above, mm. sort of that's mm. uh, encrypting into the valleys. And I think that a project that rethinks the valleys on their own terms, 
uh, and creates something that's parallel but complementary to the city needs to be developed, especially now that the airport is about to be finished in two years and they still haven't decided where the two roads that are going to connect the airport to the city will go. <laughs> they still don't know what the rights of way are going to be. So on the one hand, it's going to be a disaster, but on the other, I think there is the promise of just not build, building the roads, but actually conceptualizing a larger agenda that defines the territory rather than just the roads. I guess this would be the last question. Yes. I really enjoyed both, both of your presentations, of, um, and especially knowing more about Quito. And so uh, thinking about how very different the cities are, the one in the mountains, a small city, the one in the low, low sea, uh, sea level city and populous and big. Um, so we've been thinking about the differences between them. but the way we've structured these discussions. This is a day, to, this is a morning to look at the South American cities. And what could you each say about what joins them as compared to, let's say, North American cities or European cities from which they were largely derived? Is there something that you can say that characterizes the context <coughs> of South American cities? <coughs> well, common? you know, <laughs> I'm not a, uh, necessarily an expert <laughs> um, in, in all Latin American cities, but, but I have to go to the beginning of both our presentations. Uh, we, I think we, we love the differences because actually we know they start the same with this grid. And so you have this uh, approach to every time you go to a Latin American city that is old. Um, and... Uh, is first you look where is the grid and you know that coincides with the historic center and then from there you begin to try to understand what happens after and it is a, a, a great formula to get to know this is because you know having understood the foundational principles of all of them you immediately relate to a few things I mean, you go to Mexico, you go to Quito, you go to, you know, Lima, uh, and you know what to look for on that basic, uh, you know, uh, orthogonal grid. And from then, you begin to then really to notice, and that's what you appreciate, all the differences, that they are all absolutely incomparable cities that have nothing to do with each other. Um, if there is something more profound, philosophical, or whatever, I don't know. Of course, language right. uh, joins them all. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but, but I think in terms of these two cities, um, or at least in terms of the, uh, the southern hemisphere and Quito, there's also a very interesting uh, um, relationship, which is that sort of modern architecture yeah. in Ecuador did not arrive from Europe. It actually arrived, arrived from, uh, um, Uruguay, from Uruguay and, and Argentina, but primarily Uruguay. And uh, sort of with Guillermo Jones de Rosola and then Gato Sobral and a series of other Uruguayan architects yeah. that migrated with him. Sort of mod a very late modernity, right? We're talking about 1940s, 1950s, actually came from the south onwards, which sort of gave a very different sort of, uh, mm. uh, a very different logic to the modern project than you would actually find in the Caribbean or in, a, um, or in sort of the southern hemisphere. So I want to thank Felipe and Jorge for two wonderful presentations you. and you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.